All right. So yeah, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. Uh, and uh, today I'll be telling you kind of two work about uh, about two works that have been done um, by people uh, in Cologne and Berkeley, namely Ori, Ahim, and Ehud on the MBL part, and then I'll briefly uh, flash some uh, impressions from uh, another. MBL, uh, a machine learning story that's also partially related. So somehow along the lines of um, this workshop, the question that I will ask is whether it is sometimes profitable to study uh, open systems to better understand um, phenomena that appear challenging when discussed in purely closed setups. And an example of such a phenomena that I will discuss will be the uh, many body localization. And what I will try to show is that discussing it in an open setup um, opens new experimental and uh, numerical approaches. So um, MBL transition is a transition that happens in disordered interacting systems. So when and such a system has strong enough uh, disorder, the system changes from being thermalizing, thermalizing and ergodic into um, being uh, many body localized and behaving as an insulator at arbitrary temperatures. And why this turned out to be quite challenging, especially for numerical description is for example, because on the ergodic side, this eigenstates show area law while on the MBL side, they show uh, an, uh, so volume law, while on the MBL side, they show a volume law behavior, which means that this is a difficult challenge for the uh, tensor network approaches. And that's why people somehow mostly resorted to using uh, exact organization to study this problem. But as we are learning recently, the transition is really about the physics at the uh, level spacing. And uh, as a consequence, of course, exact organization have hard time uh, capturing it right. And there is a clear need for approaches that go beyond that. Now, the properties of um, many body localizations are probably most um, somehow intuitively explained as a consequence of uh, many local conservation laws that can be seen as dressed local operators, which then prohibit um, transport of particles. Um, but it's clear that as soon as we would couple such a system to a bath, this would uh, effectively couple these localized uh, uh, operators, conserved operators, and yeah, through this coupling, eventually unlock the transport. And that's why such um, yeah, coupling M MBL to uh, bus was mostly considered as a way to kill localization. The situation is, of course, worse if we are coupling to some thermal bath, which also implies uh, thermalization mm, of uh, the potentially MBL system, which then becomes indistinguishable from the ergodic uh, one. But what I would like to argue today is that things change drastically uh, when we add um, some driving. So we could be considering a system that is coupled to a thermal bath, but if on top we add also driving, such as open driven system will relax to a steady state that are distinguishingly different on the both sides of the transition. So, and that yeah, is a consequence of this vast asymmetry in the number of, uh, now in this case, approximate conservation loss that the ergodic and MBL uh, phase has. So on the ergodic side, we'll effectively have only one approximate conservation loss, while on the MBL side, we'll have many approximate conservation loss. And as a consequence, the study site will be approximately thermal on the ergodic side, 
and very non-thermal on the MBL side. So where is the intuition for, for these two types of uh, states coming from? Well, it can be quite nicely illustrated with this everyday example of the greenhouse, because greenhouse is also a classical example with approximately conserved energy. And we all know, and it's approximately conserved because it's the sun can add, increase the energy density and we can lose it through the windows. But we all know that even though it's an yeah, open driven system, it's described with the temperature. So we expect that also if we consider a quantum system, it will be approximately described with an Gibbs ensemble. Now, what will happen when we have many conservation laws? Well, they will, mm, yeah, they will enter on the same level. So instead of a single temperature, we will need additional Lagrange multipliers or additional um, parameters, additional generalized temperatures to describe the state that will be now more like a, a generalized Gibbs ensemble. And um, if we really now calculate a, a steady state of a disordered system coupled to baths and drivings, uh, we really see what I was now explaining. So if we, for example, calculate local temperatures um, for, for such a steady state, what we, what we will observe is that on the ergodic side, we will measure a homogeneous temperature profile because the system is really relaxing towards an, an, a Gibbs ensemble described by a single temperature. While on the MBL side, we will see like at different sites, we will measure a very different uh, temperature. And therefore, it seemed to us that a very natural way to um, describe or capture this uh, phase transition is to look at the variation of these local temperatures. Because what we expect is that on the uh, ergodic side, at least if we could take this coupling to the bus and driving to be infinitesimal, then on the ergodic side, this variation would be zero. And then of order one on the MBL side. So we would really even though we would consider kind of an open system, we would really still see a true phase transition. However, um, as we figured out, as we continue to work on this problem, when we take a finite coupling to driving and to baths, um, these corrections on top of the Gibbs or some sort of generalized Gibbs ensemble are very, play a very important role. Uh, and let us try to sort of anticipate wh what, what will happen as a consequence of, of a finite coupling to the environment. Well, um, well, we expect that now this phase transition will be smoothened into a crossover. So also already on the ergodic side, we will have some variations uh, in local temperatures. Um, and now we would like to understand actually how will this behave as I tune the coupling string to the environment. And the kind of minimal description of what should happen is that we simply consider like a hydrodynamic uh, equation, basically look at the uh, continuity equation for energy which is now uh, supplemented with a source and a sink term for this coupling that represents the weak coupling to the drive and to the bath. And what we get out of this calculation is the following result that this variation in temperature will depend on the coupling strength to the environment in a, in a non-analytic way uh, like uh, written uh, here. So, but here we forgot one thing, and namely we assume that the transport is diffusive. 
While we know that as we approach uh, the MBL transition, the system becomes subdiffusive. So one um, kind of uh, hand-waving type of, or one yeah, heuristic way of capturing this is simply, well, to, to think or to use a fractional derivative or maybe just to simplify it, kind of instead of two, uh, use Z uh, which is now a dynamical exponent that does equal to um, for the diffusion and is larger than two in case of subdiffusion. And just kind of, yeah, repeat the, um, the derivation. And in that case, what we get is that this variation of temperature profile will depend, uh, yeah, will depend on the dynamical exponent in, in that sense. So as we will, and that, that's a very good, uh, yeah, it's a good uh, sign because it means that as we will be tuning the coupling strength to the environment, we will be able to, and look at the variation of temperatures, we will be able to um, yeah, infer what is actually happening with transport with the dynamical exponent. So on the, to properly capture the MBL side, one would really have to take into account all conservation laws. But if we cheat a little bit and just say that, okay, in this case, the, uh, the already the conductivities that the system has are only due to the coupling to the environment and are thus proportional to the coupling strength to the environment. We simply at least see that epsilon cancels out of the problem in lowest order. So we again reproduce that what we expect for the MBL side is this order one of fluctuation in temperatures. All right, so now that we have some sort of uh, theoretical um, predictions for what should be happening, we actually do uh, a concrete numerical calculation. So uh, we look at the, by using, yeah, by doing the TBD uh, time propagation, we calculate the steady states of a disordered um, system of, uh, yeah, with Hamiltonian with uh, disordered uh, fields that is weakly coupled to bulk uh, Markovian baths which are only importantly not, not Hermitian so that they don't lead to an infinite temperature steady state. And um, then, so, and then we again look at this quantity. So we look at the variation of, of these local temperatures as a function of coupling strengths to the uh, Markovian baths. And what we uh, obtain is um, indeed that if we would um, if we could extrapolate these finite uh, couplings, uh, the calculations at finite coupling strengths to the bus to zero, we would see that uh, this variation of, of temperatures uh, vanishes on the ergodic side, while it is of order one on the MEL side. And when we consider uh, finite uh, coupling strengths to the environment, we see uh, this non-analytic behavior um, that indeed contains the information on the dynamical exponent uh, on the ergodic side and a simple analytic uh, dependence on the MBL side. And this now uh, allows us to, yeah, get some sense of the critical disorder strength and of what's happening with the dynamical exponent. So on the some idea of the transport properties of such a system. And um, so uh, uh, quick, quick, quick heads up, uh, five minutes. Thanks. Sure. Um, so how um, so how do we um, determine the the critical disorder? Well, we simply say look whether we have one or the other trend in the dependence on the coupling strength of the bus. And then when half of the uh, realizations, um, yeah, when the probability for, for, the, for this trend going down or up is one half, that's our estimate of the um, 
of the critical field. Uh, but I should say that this is only kind of a lower bound since we are limited to some uh, finite coupling strength to the environment. And, um, and, the, and, and we would really like to push these to be smaller as possible. And okay, to get the dynamical exponents, we essentially fit this dependence here on the ergodic side. And what we observe is that um, the dynamical exponent grows with a, a really big exponent until we observe some sort of saturation, which is again a numerical artifact because we would again actually need much smaller weaker coupling strength to the environment to um, somehow reliably determine dynamical exponent in these regimes. But still, yeah, but so our limitation is somehow, yeah, that, that to go closer to the MBL transition and following the dynamical exponent, we would need to somehow push the numerics to smaller couplings to the environment. But still where we can determine the dynamical exponent, we essentially do not see um, any finite size uh, dependencies. So these are really kind of yeah, thermodynamic uh, quantities. A quick comparison with ED on the same Hamiltonian. So we get much larger critical exponents that are so large that uh, they're essentially compatible with the KT or KT-like uh, type of the transition of MBL as compared to the ED. And also our lower bound on the critical disorder strength is also larger than what uh, was obtained with ED. Now, how would we measure this in experiments? So one possible platform would be solid state experiment where we naturally have couplings to phonons and one would have to add some um, driving like coupling to light and then measure these local temperatures by doing a local Raman spectroscopy. But not so many yeah, experimental groups have the yeah, such setup that could do this. Um, so another possibility would also be again to, make, to resort to uh, quantum simulators and then measure many different uh, local observables. So not necessarily try to really measure, I mean, in principle, this could also be done with solid state experiment if you have access to many local observables, but that's typically easier with quantum simulators. So one could essentially measure many local observables, but then instead of trying to really determine these um, local temperatures, uh, use some uh, unsupervised machine learning to extract how many parameters we really need to describe uh, this data set. And, with, um, and we have recently somehow looked a bit at this problem and of somehow asking how many parameters we need to describe measurements in a certain state by using autoencoders, which are the architecture shown uh, here, that essentially its objective is really is essentially a crop compression or, or uh, dimension reduction. So what it tries to do is tries to take the data and then reproduce it by going through a bottleneck. And the dimension of this bottleneck uh, tells us of an effective dimension of, of uh, our data. Now, if our data is many different local expectation values, uh, with yeah, our physical knowledge, we know that, for example, if we are given a thermal expectation, thermal expectation values, we really need just a single mm, kind of neuron or single in information that is the temperature to reconstruct any um, expectation value. So, um, so in this sense, such setups could be used to detect the complexity of um, our steady state and measurements with respect to this steady state. So I do not have uh, now concrete uh, results for the um, steady states of uh, disordered systems that I've been addressing throughout the talk. 
But for example, what we did uh, look at recently is how, um, what happens, so yeah, what happens if we um, feed to the network the expectation values of steady states for systems that are weakly coupled to the environment in case our Hamiltonian is chaotic or integrable. So as I said previously, we know that for a chaotic Hamiltonian, the steady state is roughly thermal, while for an integrable system, it's uh, roughly speaking an, a generalized Gibbs ensemble plus some corrections. And uh, indeed, in this case, this network was able to kind of detect really this difference between the two, uh, seeing that it needs more, uh, more uh, degrees of freedom to uh, to capture the integrable data sets and even from somehow how the network sees this data set. Um, yeah, these two, two cases are distinguishable and can even be used for the Hamiltonian reconstruction in case of chaotic Hamiltonians for the noise type reconstruction for finding out which conservation laws are really playing an important role. Um, here in case of integrable Hamiltonian. So it seems to be quite a good diagnostic uh, tool that is applicable also broader. For example, it can detect the growth and decay of complexity if you initialize your system in a simple product state and then run a, a quantum evolution on it. And it can, for example, detect the growth and then the onset of hydrodynamic description. So, um, I'm somehow, yeah, I hopefully will soon report on also, also on the application on the MBL side, but it just seems to be like uh, an, a generally nice uh, diagnostics tool for the complexity of density matrices. But here, let me uh, summarize with the conclusions that essentially in the yeah, majority of my talk, I've try to advertise that sometimes looking at problems that are typically considered in closed setups uh, in such an open setup can open some new points of view, like in our case, when we've defined a new quantity that is uh, sensible to the transition and also proposed a new uh, numerical approach to look at, to capture the properties of, of MBL transition. So uh, yeah. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions.